going to talk to you this morning about his church. I want to talk to you about the true church of Jesus Christ. What is the true church of Jesus Christ? We hope after today you'll have no questions on this matter. I don't have all the answers, but I have enough to convince you, I think, what I believe to be the living church of Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning for the love of Jesus, for your manifestation, Lord, in our presence, in our midst. Lord, without you, we have no church. We have no meeting. We have no gathering. And I pray, Lord, that you open my understanding so that I can present to this people your heart and your mind on this matter. Lord Jesus, quicken me. Lord, you gave this to me in prayer. I didn't get it from a book. I got it, Lord, from your heart. And I pray, Lord, that you minister life through what I speak this morning. Open our eyes to the meaning of your church. Let us examine our hearts this morning to see if we are really members of your body. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. <clears throat> now Jesus said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. He also said that no weapon formed against it should prosper. But you look around now and you see that the gates of hell are prospering. They're prospering against Many churches, the man churches, I call them, they are prevailing. The weapons of the enemy are prevailing. And the word prevail there means to overpower, to defeat. And you see that in a church that is really not acknowledged by God as his own church. The church by no means is a denomination. Now, denominations were caused when certain groups of Christians gathered around a pet doctrine the Baptists gathered around the Calvinistic doctrine of eternal security. The Pentecostals gathered around the doctrine of an infilling of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. The Seventh-day Adventists gathered around a doctrine about the seventh day Sab or the Sabbath being Saturday. You find uh, the Wesley Methodists gathered around the doctrine of entire sanctification, and on and on and on until there were divisions because people gathered around not the, not the person of Jesus Christ as much as the doctrine. And they got, they gathered around those doctrines and then they began to split up and reform. There's reform movement after reform movement after reform movement having to do with people gathering around the doctrine. And so you have 50 kinds of Baptists now. You've got a hundred kinds of Pentecostals. You've got all kinds of charismatic and non-denominational churches by the multiplied thousands and division everywhere you look. This was never God's idea from the beginning. Entire denominations now have been overpowered by the weapons of Satan. The gates of hell have prevailed against entire denominations where pastors no longer believe the Bible to be the inerrant word of God. They no longer believe in the virgin birth. They don't believe in a heaven or a hell. They, they call evil good and good evil. This is being overpowered. What else can you call it but the gates of hell prevailing when the seminaries of many of these denominations have uh, teachers and professors there who do everything to demean the gospel, everything to discredit the miracles of Jesus Christ, to take away his Godhead, and hell-bent professors that are hell-bent in destroying what little faith that our young people have left. If that is not being overpowered by the enemy, I don't know what is. But you see, God has discounted all of that man calls church. It's never been a part of his church. Really not been his. It's been man's, but it's never been his. He doesn't acknowledge it. In his eyes, it doesn't even exist. That which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination to God. Absolutely. God has never acknowledged it as his own church. <clears throat> but I also believe that many Christians are misinformed about the meaning of the church. They really don't understand what the church of Jesus Christ is. And I say that because of the way we measure the success of the church today. We have mega churches. We've got super churches. We've got fastest growing churches. And we look at these beautiful 
multi-million dollar buildings. We look at the wonderful 30, 40, 50 acre campuses and we see churches packed with thousands and we say, God must be there. That must be God's church. Look, their finances, they have money in the bank, they have multitudes coming. That must be a very successful church. Jesus must be at work in that church. But folks, I'm so glad to inform you that that is not God's measure of success. You can have multiplied thousands in church. You can have a burgeoning budget. You can have all of these things and Jesus not be in the building. Jesus not even acknowledge it that it's his. Highly esteemed among men, very successful, popular, accepted, but abomination in the eyes of God. A minister friend of mine recently uh, told, told me he was filling out his application for uh, every year you, you fill out uh, a form to continue your ordination. And he was filling out his form and suddenly it hit him like a sword in his heart. He said, there's nothing on this application at all that has to do with a spiritual measurement. The questions were like this. How many are attending your Sunday school? How many attend Sunday night? How many do you have in your prayer meeting? How many Boy Scouts do you have in your, in your boys program? How many women attend your women's auxiliary? And uh, give us the percentage of increase in your numbers and in your finances. What's the per capita giving per each person? There was not one spiritual question in the whole uh, application. He said, you know, I could have been a reprobate and filled out this question and still keep my ordination. Because there's no measure of my spirituality. There wasn't a question about how I was doing with the Lord. Anything about my burden for the Lord. Nothing about my morals. Nothing about my family or my vision. Nothing at all. And, and that's typical of almost every denomination. He said there was nothing spiritual about it at all. He said, I was, I was suddenly shocked at how far we've gone from understanding the true church of Jesus Christ. It's an amazing thing. Now, let me tell you what I believe constitutes his church. This is what I believe constitutes his church. And there are required features that distinguish his church from every other thing that is called church. Folks, before you leave this service this morning, I hope you understand what the church of Jesus Christ is. We have the pattern in the 20th chapter of John. Go to John, the 20th chapter, if you will, please. Quickly. 20th chapter of John. I'm going to start reading at verse 18. This is the first gathering of the church that Jesus is going to build. Now, folks, remember that Moses built a house. Moses had a church, and the Bible said he was faithful in his house. But the Bible, the Lord goes on to say, Jesus said, I will build my house. The church of Jesus Christ did not exist until after his resurrection. And he said, I will build my house. The scripture is about Christ as a son over his own house. He, he said, I will build it. And he's starting to build it right here. You're going to see the first meeting of the church of Jesus Christ. You're going to see all the features that should be in what is called his church. They're all in this first meeting. Remember, these are living stones. He's building a church, and this is the foundation. These are the foundation stones in this first meeting. Verse 18, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, and that he had spoken these things unto her. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace unto you. When he had so said, he showed them his hands in his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father sent me, even so send I you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whoso, whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Now look this way if you will, please. He's building his church, and all the features of the church from now to Jesus comes, you'll find it right here. And I want to go over it with you as simply as I know how. In this first gathering, <clears throat> you have the making and the birth 
of the true church of Jesus Christ. And first of all, his church is comprised of individual believers who have a special love relationship with Jesus Christ. Every single one of these who are gathered here have their own special revelation of Christ. He's revealed himself individually to them, and every one of them are devoted. They have given up careers. He is not just first in their life. He's everything in their life. The church of Jesus Christ is comprised of individuals who are wholly given to Christ. He has become their life. He's not a part of life. He is their life. He's the focus. He's the center. Now, that's where the church begins. It's comprised of individuals wholly given to him with their own revelation of who he is, with their own hearts burning for the word of God. Now, let's consider those that are gathered in this meeting. One of the accounts by John, it says there were 11. Luke's, Luke implies that there were many, many more in this first meeting. No doubt Nicodemus, uh, no doubt the rich man, just, uh, Joseph of Arimathea. The Bible makes it clear that the two disciples of Emmaus were there. Remember, they had their own revelation. They were so devoted to him and they had a revelation because Jesus appeared to them and opened up the scriptures regarding himself. Peter was there to whom the Lord had shown himself. They had all had some kind of revelation of him. They had seen the empty tomb. There was a revelation of the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Every one of them. Mary of Bethany was part of their Lazarus. They're all gathered. Every one of these, the thing that identifies them, that individually they had their own experience with him. They had their own revelation of Jesus. They didn't get it from somebody else. It was their own. And Mary Magdalene comes knocking on the door, and she said, I've seen him. And this gathering was not a pastor up there trying to reveal Christ to a congregation. That's not the church. The church says that every member of that congregation came there with revelation, their own experience with Christ. They saw him, they talked to him, they had the word burning in their hearts. And so at this first meeting, it is not Peter standing up, admonishing them about what they he had seen of Christ. It's first of all the woman who Jesus had cast seven devils out of. Probably a prostitute at one time. And she is the one that's saying, Pastor, I saw him, I talked to him. The two disciples, unknown disciples, I believe many of the 70 chosen disciples were there, uh, that Jesus said that were also in the meeting. And they were all excited. Every one of them were telling what they saw and heard of Jesus. This was an excited group. They came to church not to hear about Christ. They had heard of Christ. They brought Christ with them. This is the church of Jesus Christ. Individuals who have had their own experience, their own revelation of the reality, their own intimacy with Jesus Christ, the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, what a wonder that in the midst of apostasy, rejection of Christ and every all offers of his grace that's right in the middle of Jerusalem, in the middle of the darkness, in the middle of the rejection of Christ, the Lord had a body totally devoted to him. And folks, I'm telling you, even now in this day of gross darkness, in this day when Christ is being rejected, when they're trying to throw him out of our society and out of our courts, they don't even want his name mentioned. Thank God around the world, even in, in the communist countries, all over the world, Jesus has a body. He has a devoted people, of individuals, their own revelation of Christ. The church is alive and well. Hallelujah. Now listen to me closely. It is this devotion, this personal, individual devotion of Jesus Christ, which is the bond of the body of Christ. I, I travel, and when I go to another country, and I walk a street, and, and I don't understand the language, and somebody will, will say, hello, and thinking, oh, I, I must look like an American, so they give me a little bit of their American language, and I, I understand, they'll, they'll be speaking English. He said, where are you from? I said, New York. New York. Yes, and, and, and I'm a pastor there. Oh, you're Christian. Yes. Uh, what church? Times Square. Oh, I've heard of that. Praise the Lord. I'm a charismatic, just like you. 
And, and, and you said, well, you met the body of Christ. You met another. No, 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 not necessarily. Because it only takes about 10 minutes before you find out where that man's heart is. That man's heart, he's talking about his exotic vacation. He's talking about everything but Jesus. The devotion is not there. And suddenly you pull back and say, I'm not one with this man. You can go to Japan and you can walk around and you find a little prayer group and they're, they're, they're praising the Lord. And you walk in and say, I found the church. I found the body. These people love Jesus. But then the pastor gets up and you know he's not been alone with God. There's no devotion. It's all flesh. And suddenly you, know, you thought you found the church. It wasn't the church at all. It wasn't there because the bond is not there. Folks, you meet the church anywhere on earth where you find an individual that is totally voted to Jesus Christ and if they are, you'll know it very quickly and shortly and the bond will be there. We here talk about the church being united. Let, 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 let's unite the church. Let's everybody get together. Folks, you don't have to. It's already together. It's all in Christ. He's the head, we're the body. It has always been together. It's never been divided. Never. If you, if, if Jesus could come and, and take you on a flying carpet trip over the, the America, around the world, and you say, Jesus, show me the church. And he would take you into the atmosphere, so to speak. And, and you look at the, he takes you to hover over a great church of 5,000 people and say, Lord, show me your church. And he said, all right, you see the woman over here and see this one over here. And he'll pick up maybe 10 or 12. So that's my church. These are my devoted ones. But Lord, what about those thousands there that are singing love songs to you? He said, my heart, they don't have a heart for me. They, I, am, I am just a word to them. It's just deed. It's just word and it's not in deed. They don't love the truth. They don't spend any time with me. That is not my church. They don't have the devoted heart. I wonder how many of you we could point out this morning and say to his angelic host, see that sister, see that brother, see this one over here, this one over here, look how hungry they are for me. I've been te teaching them, speaking them to the years, and they're still hungry. They give me precious time, they give me quality time, my heart. I am not just something laying easy on the back road to their mind. I am the center of their life. I am everything to them. This is my church. <laughs> Hallelujah. Secondly, his church is comprised of devoted individual believers whose greatest joy is to assemble with others who share that devotion. It's called the body of Christ. They don't have to be warned, forsake not the summing yourselves together as the man of some is. Because there is something of the Holy Spirit that draws every devoted believer to the body. Now let me say this clear and simply, but right to the point and listen to it please. The church is not complete without the corporate expression. Because God reveals himself, Christ reveals himself in the corporate body in ways he cannot reveal himself individually to you or to me. For example, the gifts. How, how, how do you operate the gifts on yourself? What about the love of God that shed abroad, not just on me, but abroad, what about the joy and excitement of watching your brothers and sisters grow in the Lord and in their growth you get faith and hope? There's a shared revelation in the assembly. Everyone that was gathered in this first meeting, though they had their own private, glorious revelation of who Jesus is, they had seen him, they talked to him, they'd been with him three years, but now they're gathered together and they're going to experience a special manifestation of Jesus that could not have come individually to them. Now keep in mind that just a few days before these disciples had fled from his presence at the first sign of danger. They all forsook him and fled. But now 
fearlessly they meet in a clandestine fashion because they are taking literally now something the Holy Spirit has reminded them that Jesus said to them. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. Now, folks, they didn't take that as a promise, but as a consequence. Now, listen closely, please. God's been speaking so clearly in my heart this. It was not just a promise. That's a consequence. He's, he said, if, if you will meet in my name, and you know what needs to meet in his name, let everyone who names the name of Jesus depart from iniquity. It means these have departed from iniquity. They're not living in sin, wholly devoted to Jesus Christ, and they're meeting in his name. And the Lord said, you meet under those conditions, and there I am. Doesn't say, I will come. Doesn't say you have to fast or pray or beg or plead and wait till I come. That is the consequence of you coming in divine order. The consequence of it, the result of it, is that I'm there. And they thought, well, if he said that two or three, we better get together. Because we want him to appear. We want to see him again. So it was, they assembled together, they shut the door, and it was just as they were told. Jesus came and stood in their midst. Verse 19, Jesus came and stood in their midst. Folks, there is no church. It is not a church unless Jesus is standing in the midst of it. Unless there is a manifestation of his presence. If in every service Jesus is not there, it's not the church. They're not meeting in his name properly. You, you say, well, brother, can't we enjoy his presence alone as individuals? Why do I need the church? A lot of people say, well, I just worship alone, just me and Jesus. Well, he does manifest his presence to those that are set in with him. The scripture says, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And I will love him and manifest myself to him as, as an individual. I'll manifest myself to you. Because you see, sometimes there is an imposed isolation. L look at Paul in, in prison. He, he has isolation imposed upon him. And say with John and all of Patmos, isolation is imposed upon him. Sometimes you're sick and by yourself it's imposed upon you. That's a different thing because in those conditions when it's imposed, isolation is imposed upon you by conditions or forces outside your control, then the Lord reveals himself in a very unique way. That's where Paul got his revelation for the church and same with John and all of Patmos. What a revelation of Jesus. When John said, I saw him standing among the candlesticks, it, it was in an isolation along with the Lord. That's only when it's imposed, when it's beyond your power. But folks, when you just stay at home watching TV, there's no imposed isolation upon you. You, you, you are drawing away from the very source of the glory of the Lord. But you see, there's a reason why Jesus manifest himself to us. And I want you to listen to this, please. Jesus comes to manifest himself to us that we may have life and his power. His very life is energy, it is power. But life is given for a purpose, and that's that we may be useful to him, useful to the body. The Bible said that the life was light. You can have power without any knowledge of how to use it. That's the light. The life became the light. In other words, he doesn't give you power just, just to spin and waste it. Let me give you an example. You take a 200 what, 200 amp diesel fired <coughs> generator. Now, you put diesel in it and you start it up. It's got 200 amps of power. It's got energy. It's got life. And it, 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 as long as you give it its individual source of energy, if you keep pouring the diesel in it, it'll, it'll keep turning. It'll keep putting out energy, but it's of no use. It's not hooked up to any need. It's just wasting its energy. But then you look at the house and the house has no energy, it has no light, the lights aren't working, the stove is not working, there's no heat. And you hook it up, you hook the generator up, and suddenly 
the lights go on. Now the generator is useful. You say, I'm alone with Jesus, I'm getting revelation, I'm getting power from the Lord, I'm getting life. But I'm telling you, if you're not hooked up to the body of Christ, if you're not a part of the body of Jesus Christ, you're that generator that's wasting its energy. You have to be connected. Pick up this week's Life magazine, the November issue, and you'll see uh, an incredible sight. There's a, a man's arm and forearm laying disconnected on the operating table. It's a 13-hour operation that was accomplished by a businessman named Clint in 1989 in, in a, an accident with a chainsaw. He severed his arm. And now after two, uh, after this time, the doctors uh, severed the arm of a brain-dead man. <clears throat> and they are trans... They're now hooking this arm to this man, and it's a 13-hour operation. Now, that arm is there. It's still got blood in it, and they've got a pump there, and it's got probably a 13 to 16-hour lifespan, but it's got to be hooked up. The arm is there, but the fingers are not moving. There are no nerves. It's an arm. It's got blood in it, but it's useless. But they... Hooked him up for the, this is the second operation of its kind, and they connected the arm. And yesterday I was listening to the radio and it said that it's been successful, that he feels the nerves and the fingers are moving. Now the arm is what? It's useful. You see, if you're not connected to the body, I don't care how much revelation you get, I don't care how much time you spend alone, you are severed from the body. And you're going to have to have, you're going to be hooked up to some artificial kind of life. And you're of no use. You're going to lay on that operating table. That's a hand. It's got blood in it. It's got a form of life. But it's no good to anybody. It's useless. Folks, that's what the body of Jesus Christ, we are arm of his arm. We are bone of his bone. We are flesh of his flesh. We are connected to the head. And you can only get that in a corporate experience of the assembly, reaching together, worshiping together in him. Are you beginning to understand it? Now let's go a step further. It's not enough just to be quickened by the presence of Jesus. It's not enough <clears throat> to be just doing things, <clears throat> being useful, you, that usefulness has to be subject to his will. If, if, you know, you can, you can be hooked up to the arm, but you still have to get your directions from the head. And in this meeting, I want you to notice this. Jesus comes in and the first thing is peace. And that's what you get, first of all, when the body of Jesus Christ, when devoted people get together to worship the Lord as the body. The first thing you get is the overflowing of the peace of Christ, the peace of God. Folks, I get that every time I walk into this church. I sit down there, peace, absolute peace. But folks, he can give you peace and you not value it or not have an expression of it, not know it in its fullness, and you don't get that until you see the fullness of the body. And I'll show it to you in just a minute how... You not only are given the gift of peace from Christ, but you have to have that peace flowing in and through you. And I'll show you in a few minutes how that will happen. But you see, <clears throat> Jesus, after he gives peace, he said, As I was sent to the world, so send I you. And this is the first instruction they get. And this is the instruction you get in the corporate body of Jesus Christ. Lord said, you know that I escaped. You saw me escaping to prayer. I, you, you saw me leave you and go to the mountains. You saw that I prayed. I was getting my instructions from the Heavenly Father. He said, I did not operate on human compassion. Remember the man that came to him and said, Master, uh, mediate between me and my brother. Help cause him. Get my brother to share his inheritance rightly with me. And Jesus said, Man, who made me 
your divider or your lawyer. And what he's saying, I don't do anything except what my father tells me. That was human need. Jesus had compassion on the me, on the man, but he never allowed his compassion to get him out of the parameters of the will of God. And when you do that, when the presence of Jesus is not in a church, where people are not praying over everything and getting a direction from the Spirit of the living God, then you find men running around trying to change the world in their own energy. They sweat, they get tired, and everybody's worn out. Saying, is this all there is to it? Jesus didn't move in the realm of human compassion, though he was moved with compassion everywhere he went. He did not operate in the realm of human compassion. And folks, the church of Jesus Christ that starts only picketing and demonstrating, folks, when the movie opened up, or rather the play opened up here, Corpus Christi, on Tuesday night, this church got a hold of God. That is just six blocks from here. And that's the play where Jesus is called a homo, Jesus is depicted as a homosexual. And in the play, he plants a kiss on Judas, his lover. And he has an affair with all his 12 disciples. A homosexual affair. And folks, we prayed in this church. We sought God because our weapons and our car, but mighty through God in the pulling down of strongholds. Then after the service, I went over there. And there were about 2,000 demonstrators. There were, there were, there were statues of the Virgin Mary. There were all kinds of placards. And, 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 uh, people were there. And, and, you know, there was, I said to a brother who was with me, I said, you know, that 15 minutes of prayer at Times Square Church accomplished more against this than all the demonstrating here tonight by the hundreds. I'm not putting that down. But the church does not move in human compassion. It moves through the direction of Jesus Christ himself. And he said to these gathered in that first meeting, as I was sent, so send I you. Total dependence. Total dependence. Hallelujah. Church does not operate independent. It does not go out just to meet human need because it's there. It operates in the parameters, the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. You can be useful, but not subjected to the will of God. It has to be total subjection to his will. Hallelujah. Now, thirdly, in his church, the Holy Spirit is always at work changing people's hearts, conforming them, convicting them, and conforming them to the nature of the one they're devoted to. In other words, if Jesus is not there, there's no work of the Holy Spirit in changing lives. Nobody is really changed without the manifest presence of Jesus in the midst Jesus came into the midst and he breathed on them and a very special work of the Holy Spirit was suddenly announced. Now, folks, I want you to fasten your seat belts because I'm going to take you on a little trip here. I'm going to show you the heart of the church. <clears throat> Jesus stands in the midst. And in the 20th chapter, verse 22, when he said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. How many see that? Receive ye the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> Folks, look at me, please. He's now building his church. He's laying the foundation. There's got to be a special breathing of the Holy Spirit for them to accomplish something they can't accomplish in their flesh. And what he's really saying, look, I'm going to be sending you out. I'm going to be sending you out in the world and you are going to be mocked and you are going to be scoffed as my witnesses. You're, you're devoted to me. You want to do my will? Yes. But you're going to be persecuted, misunderstood, and beaten and stoned and you're going to be called all kinds of names as the offscouring of the world. Your flesh will want to retaliate. You're going to want to fight back. You want to defend yourself. He said, and even your brothers and sisters... Those who are supposed to be religious, those who are supposed to be devoted, those who are supposed to be brothers and sisters in me. 
He said, they're going to hurt you. They're going to wound you. You're going to have people trample over you. And he said, I'm, I'm going to breathe on you now with an expression of the Holy Ghost you're going to need because what I'm going to ask of you now, you can't do it in human strength. You're going to need the breathing of the Holy Spirit. He said, I'm going to ask you to do something that is absolutely impossible. And folks, this is the real heart. This is the real manifestation of the church of Jesus Christ. This is what the witness is. This is, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost comes upon you. You know, when I was a young preacher, almost all my young preacher friends were just like me. Lord, give me the power. I'd go in hospitals and raise the dead. I want the power that I can lay hands on every sick person. I'm going to go in the hospital and clear it out. And all we, we've had evangelists to advertise men of power. And that power was zapping people. That power was all, all kinds of demonstrations. That's supposed to be power. No, 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 no. You shall be witnesses after that you've received the power of the Holy Ghost. Folks, what is the witness? Jesus makes it very clear. There's a scripture here that most of us have just skipped over because we're afraid to face it. We don't understand. It's in verse 22. And I want you to notice verse 23 is, or verse 23 is hooked to 22. You go from 22 and that's a continuation of verse 22. Receiving the Holy Ghost, whosoever sins ye remit, they're remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they're retained. Do you see it? Are you ready to face it? You want to know what that means? You know, of course, only God can forgive sins. You know there has to be repentance and faith. So that's beyond your ability and mine. Now, the Catholic Church has taken that literally is, is, is to mean that the priest in the confession booth has the power to remit sins. Not so. Not so at all. The remitting of the sin referred to is the sin against you. It's the sin against me. It's my brother, my sister, or any enemy who comes against me and defiles me or tries to tear me down, mocks me, ridicules me, hurts me. He said, whosoever sins, he's talking about forgiveness. Jesus wants to be manifested. He wants to be told by him. He wants the whole world to know that there are witnesses to his loving, forgiving power. Who is always ready to forgive. Folks, you can go out in the street corner and you can yell all the scriptures you want. You can call that fire. You can call that the Holy Ghost. Call it anything you want. You can stand and have a healing line and thousands of people be touched. But if you've got a grudge in your heart and you're not remitting somebody's sin against you, you have no power. This is God's call to release the sin of the brother or sister who sinned against you. And the Lord is saying, now they'll answer for their sin against me. They'll answer for all the sins against grace. But on this one issue, the sin against you, you must release it. You remit it. Folks, Jesus set the example on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. He's saying, Father, no matter what they have to answer for, for their own personal sins, or sins against you, or grace, on this one matter against me, I release them. And on the judgment day, not one of those sinners, not one of those soldiers, not one of those priests will answer for that. Because the Father said, I'll remit it. Now, there are times that you can't remit because when somebody sins and the church has said, is told, commanded to take elders and speak to that individual, and then if they won't listen, bring them to the church, and if those people are set on not being reconciled, there is no repentance, even though the love of Christ is shown and the scripture is given to them, then the Bible says you can't, you can't release that. Remember Stephen being stoned? He said, Father, lay not this to their charge. He's saying, I remit the sins of these, all that are stoning me now. What about those that have stoned you? 
The church of Jesus Christ is a house where there's no vengeance. It's a house where there every devoted child of Jesus Christ has released from their heart, from the book of life, or rather from the book of sins in heaven, they have asked God to release those sins. Folks, when God began to deal with me on this last few weeks, He's had me on my knees, naming everybody that I felt has hurt me in my lifetime. Everyone who's ever harmed me, everyone who's trampled on me, everyone said anything about me. I've had to say, Jesus, I forgive them. I remit their sins. Father in heaven, now you clean it. I release them. And when I release them, he released me. And that's when you know the peace of God. The house of Jesus Christ is a house of people who have forgiven everybody. There's no grudge. There's no sign of vengeance. There's no hurt left. Some of you here now have not released somebody who's hurt you, somebody in your family, a former husband, a former wife, somebody has hurt you, and you're not releasing, you're holding it, you're full of it. That's not the church. That's not his body. When the Holy Ghost is at work in a church, he's doing just what, he'll do just what he's doing now by his loving power. He will show you the sin of unforgiveness. If you're going to have the power of the Holy Ghost, and I, I, there, there, there's an evangelist, God bless his heart. <clears throat> he, 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 he has healing lines and rather well known and Boy, boy, does he preach, but he writes me the vicious letters, hateful letters. I had to release him. I love the man. I pray for him. I have nothing but love for that man. But you see, if I let that get in my spirit, I lose the peace that Jesus gave me. He said he breathed peace on me, and I can't enjoy it because I got this in my heart. Folks, if you, you can have peace all over you, given by God and gifted by the Holy Ghost, not enjoy a bit of it because of what's in your heart. The church of Jesus Christ is a church that has remitted the sins. I don't care if on the job your boss has cursed you. I don't care what happens on your job and all those around you. You love them. And not only forgive them, pray for them. And the only way you can love your enemies is to be praying for them. Now, <clears throat> give you a... <clears throat> Do you see how important it is to have the presence of Jesus in the house? <clears throat> let, me, let me wrap this up for you. Why would you ever stay in a place where Jesus wasn't there? Why would you go to a house where he doesn't show up? Where there's no breathing of the Holy Spirit? Paul tells us that the church of man, not the church of Jesus Christ, but the church of man, the church where there's no manifestation of the presence of Jesus, is a house of vain babblings. There's meaningless worship, empty words. And he said, O Timothy, avoid profane and vain babblings. Stay away from it. Paul, the scripture says that when you put leaven in lump, it leavens the whole lump. And if there is leaven, well, there's not the presence of the Lord, there is leaven. And you say, I'm going to go there. I, I know it's not, I'm not getting fed, and I know the presence of the Lord is really not there, but I've got to go to church. Be careful. You're not leavened in that lump. Furthermore, Paul goes a step further. He said about these vain babblings, they lead to an increase in ungodliness. You'll find that in 2 Timothy 2.16. Because if you sit under a ministry 
that is not saturated with the presence of Jesus and not according to the mind of God, you're going to have error, and that is going to lead you to ungodliness. You're going to allow things in your life you never thought you would allow because you don't know that it's been dripped into your spirit and it's changing you. Now, folks, I, I'm not trying, this is not a commercial with Times Square Church because we don't have any seats left. <laughs> folks, it's more serious than that. Paul said very clearly, If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, useful to the master, and prepared for every good work. That word purge right there, the only time it's used as it is, is to remove yourself. Remove yourself from this spirit. Remove yourself from that kind of thing. Remove yourself. Folks, I have hundreds of thousands on my mailing list. As I've told you. And probably the number one complaint of all the Christians who write to us, they say, Pastor, I can't find a church where I feel the presence of the Lord. My church is dead. What am I going to do? You might be in a place where you, you say, I can't find a church that's, that's uh, really right. Folks, if, if you're going to a church that is spiritually dead and you know Jesus is not there, the Spirit of the Lord is not at work. There's no breathing of His life. Get out of it. Get out of it. Leave it. It's that simple. Paul makes it clear. I'm on good scriptural ground. He said, purge yourself of this so that you can be a useful, sanctified vessel, meet for the Master's use. He said, isolate yourself from that foolishness. But then you say, well, where am I going to find it? Let me, let me give you something the Holy Spirit gave me just last night. The same spirit that's moving on you, making you disgusted with the death that you see. The same spirit that's awakening you, saying, I want more, I need more. I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I want to grow in the Lord. I want to be in an atmosphere where the presence of the Lord is real. The same spirit that's doing that in you, he never does it in an isolated form. He does that wherever he's working on one. He's got to work on two or three more. And the same spirit that's working on you, the Lord told me, is working on people around you. And if you will just seek him with all your heart and pray diligently about this, say, Lord, lead me to that two or three that are feeling like I'm doing, being moved on the spirit like I am. Lord Jesus, lead me to them. And he will let you be brought miraculously to that body. Because if you're devoted to him, he's going to bring you to the others who are devoted to him. You're going to find the body. He'll bring the body to you and you to the body. And that may be only two or three get together. Get some of our tapes if you want for the preaching. You can worship and pray. You don't need a preacher. I'm not against having pastors or I wouldn't be one. <laughs> but what are you going to be do when you're stuck up someplace in Alaska, in a little village? So, Jesus, surely there's somebody, and God may send one, maybe two. Wonderful fellowship and prayer. He's talking about Jesus. Somebody told me recently that they were sitting around a, a dining room table, and suddenly everybody just started talking about Jesus, and it was such, they, they said it was church. It was church. Jesus came right to the table because they were they were talking about him. And, and, and they were there for an hour just talking about Jesus. And suddenly they realized, one person told me, I was in church. That is the church. Hallelujah. I hope you understand a little better the meaning of the church of Jesus Christ. Will you stand, please? Hallelujah. Does the word of God warm your heart? Did our hearts not burn in us? If you love his word, it'll burn in your heart. Hallelujah. <clears throat> now I'm going to talk to you in closing about your devotion to Jesus. During worship, 
I took a peek at the congregation a couple times out the side of my eye. <laughs> I got an eye that looks this way and can see this way. <clears throat> I knew I was going to speak this about the church, and I, I, I said, Lord, I can see what you mean. I was looking at over some of you standing in worship, and you just... Some of you never even opened, I know you love the Lord, but you never opened your mouth. And I don't know how, I know and you can, uh, still waters run deep, and I know that you, you, there are times that I pray and I never open my mouth sometimes for a whole hour alone with the Lord. But there's not that excitement about Jesus. There's not that passion and that hunger. It's not that reaching forward to his heart. And and you've been satisfied to say, well, he knows I love him. I'm not looking for some outward expression of that love. But I'm saying, if, if you're totally devoted to Jesus Christ, you will never want to be out away from the body, the assembly, the gathering of God's people. When I see people coming only Sunday morning, I don't see them any time again in the week. I can't, and and now your job may be one thing where it requires you to be there and you can't be here. But if you're a Sunday morning Christian, I couldn't mark you in any way, shape, or form as a devoted follower of Jesus. That's not devotion. Because if you're truly devoted... There's something of the Spirit of God in you that draws you to the body. And the sign that your personal devotion is waning is when your corporate devotion is waning. When you no longer attend the house of God. Now, folks, in this church, every meeting here, there's something of the presence of the Lord. The Lord, ever since we've been here, it's been a marvelous thing. And I look forward to that. I know Pastor Carter has a bounce in his walk on his way to church. He can hardly wait to get here. The same with the rest of all of our pastors. There's an excitement. Sometimes I, I do like some, I see you're running here. I mean, literally running. There are plenty of seats, but you're still running. <laughs> you're excited about Jesus. It's not that you're just saying, well, I just want to live a clean life and I want to get to heaven. If security is all you want, you've missed the whole point. I thank God for my security in Christ. But I want to know him. Hallelujah. If your heart's cold this morning, you said, Brother David, Pastor David, I, I couldn't honestly admit this morning that I'm wholly devoted to Jesus Christ. Some of you don't even know him. Some of you have walked away from him. Some of you have drifted from him. There are some of you here in the annex, watching on the screen, and some of you in this main auditorium. You had such a devotion, Lord. You were so on fire for him. You loved him. You sought him with all of your heart. You're so excited about him. Now it's kind of a drudgery, isn't it? There's a coldness. There's a slipping away from his presence. You're not getting alone with him. You don't have that hunger. You don't have that drive toward him. If the Holy Spirit's awakening you this morning, come on to the church. Come into the house of God. Come on to the body. And say, Lord Jesus, I want more life from the head. You're my head. Give me life. I I feel that I'm, I'm losing something of the life. God, pour your life into me. Get out of your seats. In the, in the annex, you go... Out into the hallway, the officer will show you how to get to the door to come into this auditorium, down the stairs, and just come and meet me here at this altar. And we'll pray with you and ask the Lord this morning to revive your spirit and bring you to a place of total, holy devotion to Jesus Christ. And that's where the church begins. You want to join the church? That's how you join. You don't sign a card. We don't have a membership here. My folks, that card doesn't mean anything if you don't have a devoted heart to Jesus. You join the church by coming to a devoted place in Christ. You say, I'm giving everything to Jesus. I'm not holding anything back. We have that all over this building. You say, Brother Wilson, I am not there yet. I, I want 
the Lord Jesus by his spirit to give me a devoted heart. Up in the balcony, come down the stairs, either side, down any aisles we sing. Let's look this way. All of you that have come forward, and for that matter, all in the audience, I feel led of the Holy Spirit to ask you to examine your heart for just a minute. Is there anybody whose sins you need to remit against you? Some past hurt or wound still lingers. Something is still there, folks, that blocks your communion with Christ. It kills the joy. Brings terror to your soul. Can lead to all kinds of other disappointing things in your walk. You've got to get to the root of it. You ask Jesus to forgive you, don't you? You want him to forgive you of every sin? He said, if we'll not forgive others, he cannot forgive us. It's impossible. So before you ask the Lord to forgive any kind of coldness in your heart or anything else, you have got to come to this place of releasing, remitting the sins of those who've hurt you. Is was it a mother? Was it a father? Was it a relative? Was it some foster parent? Somebody on the job? A boyfriend, girlfriend, somebody wound you, hurt you? Did some pastor wound you? Some church wound you? Doesn't matter who. This is the time. Folks, I want to tell you something. You can be in a meeting where the decibel of worship and praise is just like the, like the building is shaking. But there's just as much more work of the Holy Spirit being accomplished right now in his own still way that will change you forever. That's why God sent some of you here this morning. That's why you're here as a visitor. The Lord wants to get that out of your spirit. He wants to change you. I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer. The whole body here. Every one of us. Now, folks, don't pray it unless you can meet it. And the Holy Ghost, that's why the Lord says, I've given you. If you have the Holy Ghost, you have the power now to do this. You can ask, Holy Ghost, give me the power right now. I want everybody everywhere hearing me. Pray this prayer with me right now. Jesus, I ask you now to give me the Holy Spirit. In the measure I need to forgive and to remit every sin committed against me. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, he who forgives my sins, I forgive the sins of all who sinned against me. Every one, I release them. I release them before the throne. Hold not this charge against them. In Jesus' name. Now, my Lord, draw me closer to you. Forgive me. Blot out my transgressions. Give me a heart for you. Burn in me with love for my Master. And, oh God, by your Spirit, prepare me as the bride of Jesus Christ. Remove every spot, every wrinkle, and accept me before the Heavenly Father through Christ my Lord. Now we give Him thanks. Raise your hands and just thank Him. Lord, I give you thanks. I give you praise. Hallelujah. This is the conclusion of the message. Rodney, will you come with your guest, please? Uh, we have two wonderful young men visiting with us tonight. Rodney has, has been in this platform before. Rodney was a drug addict in Boston uh, and a pusher and a devil <laughs> full of hell, skinny, about dead, and Lord saved him, called him to preach. He's a missionary now down in Ecuador. Uh, it's Ecuador? That's good. Uh, Introduce this young man, if you will, please. This is Gustavo Arevalos. 
He was one of the first guys that came into the Teen Challenge program by way of the first guy that was saved and delivered in the prison ministry in Paraguay. He heard of his friend, a drug, a drug trafficker. He went to visit him in prison, and he said, I got to get what this guy has. Came to the Teen Challenge ministry over five years ago, never read the Bible before in his life accepted the Lord Jesus Christ in his life, has never turned back. He's gone forward. He's been at my right hand uh, ever since. He graduated Bible school while working full-time in ministry. He's received his official credentials as a minister of the Assemblies of God in Paraguay. But uh, the Lord gave us the privilege to be able to come through New York. And what I shared with Pastor Dave was that I want him to have the same privilege that I had over 20 years ago. And I remember like it was yesterday when Brother Dave put his hands on me and said, Lord, give him the same spirit that you gave me. And I want you to know I believe in having a, par a parental lineage. And I know what line I'm from. And I thank God for that. I'm proud of that. And I believe that God answered that prayer because for the last 22 years, my life has been used as the Lord to reach out to other addicts and other guys that were in the same shape I was. And he's one of the evidences. Praise the Lord. I uh, understand he's going to pastor your church down there. Gustavo's going to be in charge of, he is in charge right now of the day to day operations of the church. And when Lynn and I and my family finish our term in a year uh, and we come back on furlough, he will be the one who carries out this ministry uh, into the future and has the confidence that I know that he'll do a good job. Now, one other thing before we anoint him and pray over him. Uh, we had a team just visit you. Uh, one of our elders, uh, Ignatius, was there. Tell, you told me this afternoon about the story of the man with a gun. Two incredible miracles. And for you, for the team that came, we received the best of the best. There were eight. And I know that the prayers of this church behind them made a big difference because really their visit was with signs and wonders. Two miracles occurred. One, and probably more than that, but two that I can tell you about tonight. There was a man that, that came to my office as the team was out on the streets. He told me that he had a pistol to his head that morning. He wasn't a believer. He was a God-fearer. God spoke to him and said, don't do it. I've got a plan for your life, and I'm going to show it to you today. And he put the pistol down, and as he walked out, on the street, one of the team going by with the literature distribution handed him our tract, which is a testimony of one of the men that got saved. It has the address the, of where our center is, and he came directly there the same morning. I mean, it was like 20 minutes after the team was still out doing literature distribution. He was downcast. He lost his family. He lost everything. And he says, I'm at my wit's end. I don't know what to do. And I got this like it was a word from God. And I said, it was. And we prayed, and he accepted Jesus into his life. He came the next day. He was out in the street meetings with us, with the team. And he came to church last Sunday. And I want you to know that his face is shining like a newborn baby. Praise the Lord. What's the other? We were working on the streets. We were every night and doing a street meeting in a neighborhood that is made out of cardboard and wood houses, the poorest neighborhood in the city of Asuncion, La Chacarita. And I'm sure you'll be hearing the team members when they have share their testimonies. But one of the guys, and I explained to the team, like we used to always do, is to concentrate in the neighborhood, not to go and shoot everywhere. Because when you concentrate, God has a work to, he does a concentrated work in that area. And then you go Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And by Friday, somebody that was just listening on Monday is going to get saved. In this case, there was a guy that was listening from afar off, and he had heard of Teen Challenge, he had heard of Centro Victoria from his friends, but he was a transvestite. And he was listening from afar off, and the next time that he was there, and I, I noticed that he was listening, he was a little bit closer, and he didn't have any makeup on, he wasn't dressed like a woman. By the last night on that we were there, he was dressed in street clothes, he gave his life to the Lord, and he got in the bus with us, and he's in the program tonight. Believe a new life in Jesus yeah. Christ. Pastor Carter and elders, will you come? If you will, please. We're going to pray for this young man. The Lord will make him an effective pastor and uh, use him to win many souls in Ecuador because uh, these pastors need If you'll anoint him, if you, uh, Pastor Carter, I'll appreciate it. And, and I'll pray and we'll just, uh, yes, you can interpret because he speaks no English. All right. Would you have him kneel, please? Have him kneel down, please. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. 
You kneel by him and just repeat. Lord Jesus, we lay hands on this young pastor and we anoint him with oil. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that you would give him a vision of your nature and who you are, that his life will always be one that is close to you, that he will be fearless. Lord, his life is going to be threatened. He's going to go through very hard times. He'll never be rich, but you're going to make him rich in the knowledge of God. Fill him with the Holy Ghost. Make him a mighty soul winner. Make him a firebrand that will burn throughout the whole nation. I'm asking you, Lord Jesus, that you will keep him humble and broken and open his heart to the needs of all his people. Now, Lord, bless him with the anointing and with the unction of the Holy Spirit and surround him with people who will be a strength to him. Lord, I'm asking you to give him one friend who will walk with him the rest of his life. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Okay? God bless you, son. Amen. God bless you. It's good to see you. Okay. Let him go down with us to hear on the uh, speaker. To our visitors, welcome to New York. Welcome to Times Square Church. Amen. Welcome to the presence of the Lord. I want everybody that knows you're saved. If you know you're saved, there ought to be a smile on your face. And I want you to turn around and put a smile in everybody's face around you because I need a smiling crowd to preach this message tonight. Turn around. Everybody, everybody smiling in this house tonight. I'll tell one next year, I'm happy in the Lord. I'm happy in the Lord. I am happy in the Lord. No grouches here tonight. Got enough of them out in the street. I won't come to church and be among grouches. Amen. My message tonight, don't lose your song. Don't lose your song. <clears throat> Amen. Go to Revelation 15th chapter. I'll tell you what. Let, let's start uh, with Re uh, Revelation 14. Let's go to Revelation 14. That's the last book in the Bible for all the new converts, please. And some of the old converts. Start reading verse 1, chapter 14, Revelation. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts, and the elders, no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. For they are they which have not been defiled with women. They are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb with us, whoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Now go to chapter 15, please, beginning to read verse 1. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Now, here's where we start again. Verse 2, And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Lord, it's not going to be long. We are going to live this 
what we have just read. We're going to be around the throne of the Lamb of God, and what a meeting that will be. Lord, we've talked about it, we've taught about it, preached about it, we've sang about it, and one day we'll be a part of it. Oh, God, but here we are in this world now walking through Babylon, and, Lord, we have to have a song. Put a song in our heart and help us, Lord, not to lose it. Speak, Lord, through your servant tonight. I humble myself before you, and I, I, I tell you before this congregation that I'm wholly dependent on you. I have resigned myself into your hands. Lord, if anything happens tonight, it's because you make it happen, because the Holy Spirit makes it happen. If this word is going to touch anybody, change anybody, encourage anybody, Holy Ghost, you have to do it, because I can't. So I give it over to you. I'll speak it. Lord, I'll yield my body, my mind, my vessel. I've prayed about it. I've sought it. Now you do the work. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now in the 14th chapter of Revelation... Uh, we're introduced to this great host of the redeemed gathered around the Lamb of God. They're gathered around. Now, it, it says there are 144,000. Now, the Jehovah Witnesses used to claim that that was their group because, you know, there were only about 40,000 when they started that theology. And then when they got to 140 and they were still evangelizing, it got a little scary, so they kind of backed away from that when they got to 200,000, and then when they got to 300,000, that thing has kind of faded away. 144,000 folks mentioned here is strictly uh, a Hebrew formula for multiples of 12. It just means an endless number. It has no other meaning than that. The 144,000... Forget some theology uh, built around the 144,000. This is just an innumerable host. Now, these are not all Jews, though redeemed Jews are going to be among them. Now, the Mount Zion referred to here now is the New Jerusalem. And, of course, you know who the Lamb is. That's the precious Savior that we celebrate. Hallelujah. That's Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, this great multitude's gathered around the Lamb, and they are called virgins, which means they have not committed idolatry. That means that they're not spiritual adulterers. They're not worshiping gold and silver. They're wholly given. They, they are not cheating on Christ. They love him with all of their hearts. And the Bible said they follow the Lamb wherever he goes. They've been redeemed from among men. Now, they're called here the first fruits. Now, some theologians and some prophecy experts say that this is the first fruits, that these would be those who the term is called raptured. They're going to be taken out uh, of the world and they're going to stand before the Lord as the first fruits. There are others that teach that uh, these are those all who have died in the Lord from the Old Testament. Others that these are those uh, who are uh, going to be a special a group of dedicated, consecrated Christians that are going to be taken up first in a series of, of uh, resurrections. All we know is that these have died in the Lord. They were justified by faith. They were virgins. That means that they, they were not uh, touching anything of this world. But folks, I don't want to get... I want to, don't want to get into the theology of the 144,000. We're talking about two groups here, one in the 14th chapter and another in the 15th chapter. In the 15th chapter, there's a huge multitude there. They're standing on a sea of glass, which represents the absolute crystal purity of Jesus Christ. It means to me nothing more than they're not standing before him in their own righteousness, that they are wholly dependent on the holiness of Jesus Christ by faith. They're standing on the sea of glass. Not on, they're not standing on any of their own merits. They have no other claim. Now, the amazing thing, I, I don't believe that you have to figure out who they are and how they got there and when they got there. It's good enough that they're all together around the throne now. That's the whole point of it all, that one day we're going to be redeemed. If you know Jesus, you're going. Now, I don't care what, you know... I don't understand, man, we have whole denominations built around these little details of how we're going to get there, and when, and so forth. All I know is there's a trumpet going to sound, and 
The dead are going to be raised first from the grave, and then we that alive remain who are virgins. In other words, we love Jesus with all our heart. We don't have any other loves that compare to him. We're not, we're not loving the world or the things of the world, and we trust in his salvation. The Bible said we're going to be taken. He's going to meet us in the air, and he's going to take us to the throne. And we are going to meet Jesus face to face. Now, there's a wonderful thing here. It's quite a sight that's described. This great gathering, this multitude, are all given harps, instruments. Uh, are, are probably every conceivable stringed instrument that, that could possibly imagine. Instruments we know nothing about. Now, this, this happens to be multitudes, innumerable multitudes standing before the Lamb of God gathered around him. And they're all given harps, the Bible says. Now, I've never learned to play a harp. I've wanted to harp in this church ever since we've had the doors open. But we've got the guitars and we've got things like that. But everybody's going to have the talent to play this thing. I've heard a hundred banjos at one time. What a sound that was. I mean, it almost lifted me out of my seat because I love banjos. Maybe he'll give me... A banjo, I don't know. (laughs) I'm not trying to be facetious, but the Bible says they all had harps. They all had instruments. And they were singing, and they were strumming on their harps and singing a song that was so overwhelming that John said it was the sound of roaring waters like thunder, a melodious thunder. Can you imagine... Mm. This multitude, uh, so overjoyed at seeing Jesus face to face, person to person. I want you to know something, that Jesus is God, but he's also still man. He never gave up his manhood. That when we see him, he's going to walk among us. He has feet. He has hands. He has hair. He has eyes. He has a mouth. He has a body. He walks. He talks. He sings. He's a man in glory. And we are going to be gathered around this man who is God. He's in flesh, but he's man. And we are going to have bodies like unto his. We're going to have new bodies. You see, Brother Wilkson, this great scene, you mean we're not just spirits floating around with spirit instruments and spirit voices? No, it's a literal scene. It's an absolute literal actual scene with millions upon millions of bodies, celestial bodies. Hallelujah. Illuminated by the light of his holiness. I don't know, and folks... There are going to be no angels leading this. We're all going to know when to start, and we're going to have a song. And it's a particular song. Folks, not everybody going to be singing Times Square Church style, and then over here is Brooklyn Tabernacle singing their song, and over here is somebody else singing their song. It's one song. But. It's a song you learned here. I'm going to prove it to you. And if you don't learn it here, you're not going to be able to sing it there. Because they sang the song of Moses. The Lord told us the song and he's given us the words. I believe in a literal scene when God, I, the, the, the leaders of, of this great gathering will be musicians right out of this earth who have wholly given themselves to the Lord. I don't know how it's going to happen, but I know that we're going to know when to start. And folks, when those harps began to strum and the voices began to rise, the Bible, the the description of it, it was like thunder, melodious thunder. Now, when God says thunder, you better believe it's thunder. It is a sound that uh, shakes the celestial glories of Almighty God. Singing the song of Moses. Hallelujah. What are these saints singing? And what song is it? And what are the words? 
The Bible says, and they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. That's Revelation 13, 15, 3 there. Now keep in mind, the scriptures already stated plainly that some that sang before his throne, these who, in fact, those who are redeemed to sing it have already learned this song because those that are in heaven, the, the heavenly beings, can't learn this song. Now, I've, I've heard it said, well, they're going to sing the song of redemption because the angels were not redeemed. But it's more than that. It's not just the song of redemption. Not at all. It's more, it's a song of the greatness and faithfulness of the Lord in the midst of fiery trials and overwhelming troubles. It's not just the song, I've been redeemed and saved from sin. No, no. That's only half the song, and I'm going to prove it to you tonight. Moses' song is a two-part song. Many have, many know the first part of the song, but many have lost the second part, the, the part that's going to be sung around the throne of God. I'm telling you now, Moses, his song went great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Revelation 15.3. But it's, it's, it's much, much more than that. And I want you to follow me close enough, if you will, please. The Song of Moses is a two-part song. One part comes to us as Christians, as believers, almost naturally. It's a spontaneous song that wells up after the victory comes. Now, you have heard my sermon, Right Song, Wrong Side. I preached that years ago in this pulpit. I, I turned on the radio and I heard a man preaching right song, wrong side. And I said, that's my message, word for word. <laughs> he didn't say a word. He said it was his. I don't care who preaches. It's truth. This is the song that's sung on the victory side. This is the song of Moses that was sung after the children of Israel were delivered. Now, one day before, just a few hours before the victory song, they were murmuring and they were complaining. I want you to go with me to Exodus 15, if you will, please. Exodus 15, this is where the first part of the song is uh, shown to us. Exodus 15th chapter. First six verses. Are you with me? You ready to go? Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse of the rider he's thrown into the sea. Isn't that a wonderful song? The Lord is my strength. We sing it here in song. He's my song. He's become my salvation. He's my God. I'll prepare him a habitation, my father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. Thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. Hallelujah. I have heard that song in this church. I heard it tonight. For many of you, because God has accomplished something a few days ago. You were in uh, pain. You were in a problem, and the Lord has delivered you, even though you murmured and complained about it. In his mercy, he delivered you, and now you, you clap so loud tonight. You had your hands up. Wonderful deliverer. It's wonderful. Folks, those are nice words. That's fine. But just a few hours before, the Bible says, they were saying these words because there are no graves in Egypt, Moses. Have you taken us away to die in this wilderness? Why have you dealt so with us to carry us out into, out of Egypt? Been better for us to serve the Egyptians. We should die in this wilderness. That was their song. But now the Bible says they saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. All the problems ended now. Glory to God. What a wonderful song. Miriam danced. They all played the, 
tambourines and playing their harps and singing and shouting and praising God. God is victorious. And God looks down and says, three days from now, they're going to sing the same old song. They're going to lose the song because they're going to get thirsty. I'm going to test them again. God knew exactly that they didn't have the right song. Oh, they had the right song, but it's on the wrong side. They should have, if they had sung that on the other side, the testing side. Mm Mm-hmm. I I preached Sunday night. Did I preach Sunday night? Yeah, Sunday night called Turn Off the Stew. I had a lady come back. She said, boy, Monday morning I went to work, and I got a call, and boy, the fire was on. I was. Te- How many of you got tested this week, huh? How many of you already got tested? Uh huh. How many of you turned off the stew? How many of you able to sing in spite of it? How many of you still had your song? They went three days. Exodus 15. They went three days. The Bible just. The song has just ended. The song has just ended. And in verse 22. It just, it's just ended in verse 22 to 24. They went three days to the waters of Merah, and the people again murmured against Moses. They lost their song. Oh, how quick do you lose yours? Do you even get home from a service? Now, most believers have sung the Victory Side song, and, and many times that the Lord in His mercy... Uh, delivers them from their trials, but that is not the song that is going to be sung around the throne of the Lamb. That is not the song of Moses. Now, you, it says song of Moses, but that's the first part. That's the part that is sung here on earth. God hears it. God, God thanks you for it. He thanks us all. We're to praise Him and love Him in a victory. God receives it. He, he'll not turn it down if it comes from an honest heart. But how sad, how hurtful to God It has to be that so many of his beloved lose their song when things go wrong, when financial problems pile up, when sorrow and pain and suffering comes among children or family or on the job or in the career, and when the rent has passed due, and when things are looking so bad, and maybe there's slander, and there's difficulty, and there's trouble upon trouble. How many grieve him? How many hurt the heart of God by thinking, maybe not saying, but thinking, God, you have not heard me. I go on month after month and year after year in loneliness. I have emptiness in my heart. I don't feel, Lord, that you've been faithful to me. I don't feel like you're answering my prayer. When things have gotten so tight and there's trouble in your life. Beloved, I want to tell you something. We've not arrived in New Jerusalem yet. We're not there. Our path goes right through Babylon. We're not living in New York City. We're living in Babylon. We live in Babylon. I'm not talking about just New York. Because I'm talking about any Christian in this sin-cursed world now. This is Babylon. And there are going to be tests, there are going to be trials, there are going to be persecution, there are going to be trouble, there are going to be things you don't understand. There are going to be times of disappointment and disillusionment. You're going to have these times. Christians are tenant. The Bible said many are the afflictions of the righteous. Many. I, I, I was reading some of the letters that come to us from all over the world, and t- today so many letters I was reading say, Pastor Dave, would you please preach more about suffering? We're suffering. Tell us why and how we can bear with it, and please give us some meat. We're not getting it from our pulpits. We are suffering, and we don't know how to handle it. In Psalms, don't turn it, but Psalms 137, the first four verses, the children of Israel now are in captivity at Babylon. And it says of them by the rivers of Babylon, there's where we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. 
But how should we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Now, I've dealt with this in another message. I told you what I thought of this scene and what the Holy Spirit was speaking to me about. I don't see the Babylonian soldiers coming to them, uh, you know, with a sword at them saying, stand up and sing and dance like somebody's got a gun and shooting bullets at your feet making you dance. Not at all. Excuse me. These Babylon soldiers who served gods that left them empty and cold. They were calloused and hard and there was nothing to life. There was no joy. There was no victory. There's no peace. There's nothing. They served dead gods and left them dead and cold and empty inside. And the whole Babylonian society satiated with pleasure and sex and money and greed. And it's left them nothing but emptiness and sorrow of heart. And they've heard of these followers of Jehovah God that he put a song in their heart. That they would dance and they sing these joyful songs. All the heathen world knew of the wonderful songs that came out of Zion. They were called the songs of Zion. They danced by it. Even the heathen gathered around and, and, and were, were marveled at these people in their hardships going through a desert that could still sing. And they, I don't believe it was sing or die. I, I, I believe it was a plea. Please sing a song of joy. Please prove to us that there are still a people on the face of this earth that have a God that can keep them in their hard times and put a song in their heart that everything is black. I think there was a cry that said, if you don't show us, there's no hope. If you can't sing in a dark hour, please sing us one of your songs. Dance for us. Show us some joy. Here they are hanging their hearts, God's people, with all the promises, with all the blessings promised. God himself saying, I have you in the palm of my hand. And these people saying, how do you expect us to sing what we're going through? And how many, I've heard that in this church. I've had people say, I can't sing. I'm dead. I'm dry. I'm empty. I'm a blank. And that's exactly what the world, that the, what the job is saying to you and everybody around you. They're not wanting you to come into their presence on the job and wherever you are with a long face and mourning as if your God is dead. The cry on the job and on the street and everywhere else. No, oh, where is a God that can keep you in sorrow? Where is a God that can keep you a song when you're hurting and when you're down and when you can't pay the rent? Where is the song? Otherwise, they, 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 they finally, they see them hanging up their heart. By the way, where did you hang yours? Was it when the last time you cried and it wasn't answered, did you hang your harp up then? Is it because God's still testing you and you hang it up and then you say, Pastor, you don't expect me with that. If you knew what I'm going through, how do you expect me to sing and be happy? And so the Babylonians looked at these Israelites in their, their downcast condition. They say, you're God. What a God you serve, just like ours, dead. You have no more joy than we do. There's no testimony. Folks, the only testimony, you can go out and spout all the scriptures you want. You can, you can lecture people about living in sin. You're not going to get through to them until they see in you, no matter what happens, they see you trusting your God and singing a song, no matter how dark it gets. Hallelujah. Now consider... The other part, the second part of the song, the part that has to be learned, the part that the redeemed are going to sing around the throne of the Lamb. This song is learned in the midst of, oh, it can only be learned in the midst of severe trial and temptation and tempest. Moses is now 120 years old. Now, that the other song was sung 40 years ago, the first part. That's a song that anybody can sing that has ever experienced any victory here on earth. But the song that you and I have to learn 
is this song that he gives us in the midst of the worst trial and temptations and sufferings in our life. And you have got to learn it now or you can't sing it then. Because you're not going to learn it just by being translated. The Bible says the song that the angels couldn't learn because they've never been tested. They've never been tried. Deuteronomy 31, 14, the Lord said to Moses, he's 120 years old now, and the Lord's already told him to go to Horeb. He's got to go, he has to uh, go right on through the plains of Moab and go up to the mountain, and the Lord's going to take him home. But Moses, in Deuteronomy 31, 14, said, the Lord said to Moses, the days approach that thou must die. And the Lord appeared in the tabernacle, in a pillar of a cloud, and it stood over the door of the tabernacle. I want you to go to Deuteronomy 31 now, and I want to show you what he was shown. A devastating message came from God. Deuteronomy, can I hear the leaves turning? 31st chapter of Deuteronomy. I presume most of you are still in Deuteronomy. Right, begin with verse 16 with me, please. And the Lord said, now, now, look, look this way for just a moment. The Lord appears in the tabernacle, the cloud of fire. And out of this cloud of fire, this is what he says to this man who had given 40 years of his life. I mean, he, he had literally laid down his life for this people. And here's what the Lord said. And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, and this people will rise up and go a warring after the gods of the strangers of the land, whether they go to be among them. And they will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. My anger shall be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them. I'll hide my face from them. They shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, Are not these evils come upon us, because our God is not among us? And I will surely hide my face in that day for all the evils which they have wrought, and that they have turned unto other gods. Now therefore write ye this song for you, and teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. Now this is a prophetic song, a warning. When many evils and troubles are befallen you, this song shall, be, uh, shall testify against them. It shall never ever be forgotten. Now look at me please. Moses wrote the song out and he wrote the music. There, there was a tune to this evidence, and he taught it to the people. And he, and, and just before he taught it, or right after he taught it, he added these words. He said, I know your rebellion and your stiff neck. Behold, while I am still yet with you, this day you have been rebellious against the Lord. How much more after my death? For I know that after my death you will utterly corrupt yourselves, turning aside. Evil shall befall you in the latter days. Because you do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the work of your hangs. And then he said, this song is going to be a testimony against you. This is going to be a song. Now, folks, the words of that song are still here. They're before us now to learn because he said this is for the latter days. It's for our generation right now. And it's a warning from the Lord. He said, when you get tested and tried, he's trying to tell Israel, he's telling the spiritual Jew that we are now. He's saying they're going to, there's come a time when you're going to be tried. There's going to be a time of trouble such that the world has never seen. It's going to be tested and tried. He said, many of you, when I prosper, you're going to turn against me. That's exactly what's happening even today with the prosperity message. People get, they get their money, they, they turn away from the Lord, they don't fast, they don't pray, they don't seek the face of God, and they go dead and empty. And when they get all of these things that their heart crave for, they have forsaken the Lord. No more intensity for Jesus. He said, that's, there's a, there's a song that's been written already to warn you, be careful when I bless you. Be careful when I prosper you. But be careful, especially when hard times, when you suffer. Listen to it again. When many evils and troubles shall befall you. Listen to the words of this song. Don't accuse the Lord of unfaithfulness. Don't accuse him of having forsaken you. 
Be careful what you think. Be careful what you say in His presence. Because you would anger a God who's given Himself and His promises to you. And you would not believe Him. He said, it's your unbelief that will bring my anger. And then because of your unbelief, you will bring other greater evils upon you worse than ever. Folks, I take heed to that first stanza of this song. You, you cannot learn the song of Moses. You cannot learn this song to be sung around the throne until this really lays hold of your heart. I, I cannot just spout things off. You say, well, didn't Jesus say, Father, why have you forsaken me? <clears throat> that was just, I've talked about this, this sudden human response, but it has to be dealt with. And Jesus didn't go out that way. He quickly said, into your hands I commit, I commend my spirit, lest the people's thought around him that he'd given up on his father. No, his last words, into my, into your hands I commit my spirit, my soul. I commit everything to you, my father. I trust in you. Before the whole world, his was a testimony of trust. And until you understand this part of the song, I cannot. God will not allow me in my trouble to go morning, day after day and complaining. He will not permit me to mouth off in me these thoughts and these words that Almighty God who gave His only Son would abandon me, does not hear me, does not see me. It's just the height of unbelief, the height of despair. It's a slap in the face of Almighty God. And the Lord doesn't take it lightly. Oh, the Lord doesn't mind that immediate, sudden, human response. But you have to lay hold of that and say, no, 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 no. And I want, I want to take you just a little further into it now. In the night, Psalms 42, 8, David said, in the night, his song will be with me. In the night times, the hard times. Psalm 71, David said, Thou which has shown me great and sore troubles, you shall quicken me again. You will bring me up from the depths. In other words, this pit, I mean, God, you're going to bring me up. Oh, my God, unto thee will I sing with a harp. Because I know you're going to bring me out. Hallelujah. Now, you see Moses now. He's leaving, and he's on his way to the mountain. He's, he delivered this first part of the song. He said, now, be careful what you say from now on. I'm going to be gone. Be careful what you say. Saints of God, this is the message to us. Walk softly when you're in hard times. Walk softly. Don't even think that he's left you. Don't even think for a moment he doesn't know where you're at. He's counted every hair on your head. He knows every thought. He has put a wall around you. He knows how far the devil can go and no further. He knows how to bring you out of temptation. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows all things, and you've got to understand that. And until he works, until he moves, be careful. Be careful. Folks, I have the holy fear of God on me now and as I walk before him in this. And, and this, once you have this holy reverence and fear of God in this area, then it opens up something that you'll see here in just a moment. So beautiful and powerful. You see, some people have never learned to sing in the rain. But see... This man is on the way to Mount Nebo, humanly speaking, had every right to be discouraged and downhearted and questioning God. Look, how would you like to pastor a congregation of possibly three million people, and you take 600,000 men at least, and their wives, it, it, it would probably be another five or 600,000, uh, and then all the children and the grandmas and the grandpas, uh, many estimate as many as two and a half to three million but at least 600 men and uh, 600,000 men, and you give your soul, you give your life, you're up night and day ministering, and, and he's got to admit, ever since I've known them, the whole time I pastored them, 
They were stiff-necked. They were hard. This, this man has probably suffered more than any man on the face of the earth to the time of Christ. Can you imagine? He buried probably a million and a half people. He had to bury one time 17,000 at once. Mass graves. He had to weep over a people who murmured and complained. And now after all this, God has told him, he says, they're, they're, they're going to backslide. They're going to go into the land. Even their children are going to backslide. They're going to go and possess the land. They're going to get fat and rich and they're going to forsake me. Now this man, humanly speaking, had every right to say, oh God, why didn't I stay up in the wilderness with those sheep? Why couldn't I have just been shut alone with you in a secret closet? And at least I wouldn't have had this heartache. No, 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 no. Moses, in spite of all around him, he doesn't look back because he's learned a song. And he learned it so well that God said, I'm going to choose this song. This is going to be the song that all the overcomers are going to sing around my throne. It's the song of Moses. I want you to go now to the 34th chapter. And here it is. Verse 26, beginning to read. Now here's the song of Moses. And this is the song we're going to sing around the throne of grace. Uh, around the throne of Christ. There is none like unto the God of Jeshurun. And that's the new Jerusalem. Who rideth upon the heaven in thy help, and is in his excellency on the sky. Folks, let these words sink in. The eternal God is thy refuge. Underneath are the everlasting arms. And he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee, and shall destroy, and shall say, destroy them. Israel then shall dwell in safety alone. The fountain of Jacob shall be a, upon a land of corn and wine, and the heaven shall drop down dew. Happy art thou, O Israel, who is like unto thee, O people saved by the Lord, the shield of thy help, who is the sword of thy excellency. Thine enemies shall be found liars unto thee, and thou shalt tread upon their high places. Hallelujah. Now let's stop for just a minute before I close, and let's go in detail this song of Moses. He says, God shall ride upon the heavens to your rescue, number one. That is what we're going to be able to sing then. I have proven, I have tested God, and when I was in trouble, and I thought I was going down, I held my faith, my confidence in Him, because I saw Him on a white horse. The Bible said He will ride to my rescue. That's the song of Moses. Moses said, Oh God, though all us forsake you, I have proven. Every time I was in trouble in the last 40 years, you came to my rescue. You delivered me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Not one of my enemies triumphed over me. My brother and sister rose up against me, but you delivered me. All the enemies, the kings, all around me rose up, and you delivered me. I trusted in you, O oh God, because I saw you riding to my rescue. Part two. Underneath me are the eternal arms of the everlasting God. Underneath. Moses said, are the everlasting arms. I may not see them sometimes. I might not feel them. But by faith, I accept what he said. I have my arm. I come riding my horse to your rescue. In my time, in my way, he's not one second early, one second late. And when you think you're about to fall, you fall nothing but into his arms. Unto him was able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before his throne with exceeding great joy. His arms are under me. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings thou shalt trust. Part three, he will deal with your enemies. He shall thrust out all your enemies from before thee. Verse 29, your enemies shall be exposed as liars. You know who those enemies are? Demon powers that whisper in you, you're going to fall, you're not going to make it. And those people who slander you around, God says, I'm going to expose all that. And folks... If you trust God in your hard times, God will expose every lie of the devil. He'll start exposing one after another. 
And that's what, that's what you're going to see, and that's what you're going to hear from the Holy Ghost. He said, I'll expose all of your enemies as liars. Glory to God, and said, I'll be your strength. I'll be your arm. Now, there's something I've, I've got to say. Again, no man, the scripture said, could learn that song, but those which are redeemed from the earth. They learned the song on earth. They learned it through their testing and their trial. Now, folks, learn it tonight. You, it's something, now, to learn means it's a knowledge, a skill obtained, obtained by study and experience. What you learn is what you get through study and experience. Day after day, you practice it. It's not something you learn at one time. I have to get up every day when the enemy comes in like a flood. When trouble comes, I have to lay hold of this song. It's not something I sing out loud. It's that still small song, that voice inside that's ever singing psalms unto the Lord and singing to his faithfulness and saying, Lord, I resign to your will. I resign. You'll not let anything happen to me, but such is right. Because you're a loving father. I turn my kids over to you. I turn my family over to you. I turn my job to you. I turn this church to you. I turn everything in my life over to you. I resign to the will of God. And I believe you will bring me out. And I will sing of the faithfulness. And when I'm in the darkest trial, I'm going to sing. You will ride to my rescue. Your everlasting arms are under me. You will cause my enemies to be dispersed and you will expose all the lies of the enemy. And I will be your strength. And I will be your song. Learn it now. How in the world do any of us expect to spend our time here? And with this I close, we spend our time here in a hard time and we murmur and complain and we doubt and we fear and we accuse God. Do you think suddenly you're going to be translated and somebody put a harp in your hand and they sing, sing? You'd be singing a lie because you didn't learn the song. You didn't learn the song. I'm learning it. And I tell you, it's bringing a peace to my soul this past year through the word. Folks, maybe nobody else in this church is getting set free, but I'm getting set free, free by the word that Pastor Carter's preaching and what he's bringing to me, a peace and a calm like I've never known in all my lifetime because it's truth that sets you free. Folks, I, I don't try to fix anything anymore. I don't try to work anything out. I don't care how dark, I don't care what the trouble is. I said, oh God, I'm going to sing your song. You know where I'm at. You're on your white horse and you'll come running when you're right on time. You won't move until you know it's time. But when it's time, you will be there and your arms are there all the time. I'm not going to fight this. I'm going to rest. Do the problems go away? No, but the Bible said, he he, he says right here, he, he says, thou shalt tread upon their high places. And what that means, I'm going to lift you up above it all. And they're going to lift you up into the heavens. You're just going to trust me? <laughs> you think you can work anything out? Forget it. Forget it. You're just going to mess it up. Oh, I, I used to be that way. I'll fix it. And I'd get on the phone and... The more I talked, I just put kindling on the fire. No, 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 not anymore. God help me. Now I'll be tested. I got to, I, I got to dig in on it every day. But here, here's the song: "The Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He's become my salvation. He's my song." Hallelujah! Stand. <clears throat> Don't lose your song. You know what I pray? <clears throat> Choir? Church? I pray you got convicted out of your song. The blues. <clears throat> and God convicts you by his spirit and his word. And no matter what you're going through tonight, 
You say, oh, Jesus, forgive me for doubting you. Forgive me. That's true repentance. Oh, how he loves to see his people trust him in the hard times. That's our testimony to this world. Folks, people don't know it, but we're on the brink of a great shaking. He said, go shake everything can be shaken. You better learn the song. Learn it now. See, if, if you learn it in the, in, in, in the little easier lessons, it, it gets, the song gets stronger and stronger, gets better and better. Until finally you get such peace and the devil gets so mad because he can't get you stirred. He can't rile you. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit. I thank you for your holy word. Your pure word, O oh God, that comes from your heart. Only to, if you convict us, it's only to deliver us. To bring us into a sweet rest. Lord, the only way to enjoy you is to resign to you. There's no other way to enjoy you but to resign to your perfect will. And say, here I am. Do what you will with me. Do what you please. Do what you please. You'll not leave us begging bread. You'll not forsake us. Lord, you'll test us. You'll try us. There'll be suffering. There'll be hardship. Sometimes tremendous hardship after hardship. But you said, I'll be with you through it. I'll see you through. My arms will always be under you. Hallelujah. The everlasting arms. I'll always be under you. Lord, I want to sing the song of Moses all through the rest of my life. So that when I get around the throne of God, I won't have to be taught. I will have learned it. I will have learned it. Hallelujah. If you're here tonight, up in the balcony, you'll go to the stairs on either side and come down in the aisle. But do you need to repent of even this feeling that you have lately? I don't think you'd want to accuse him of anything, but there's just a sense, oh God, what's going on? Some of you need to repent tonight. If God's dealing with you, I want you to come. Now, if you're backslidden, you need to come also. But no matter what your trial is, if you're going through suffering and difficulty, and maybe you've lost your song, you said, brother, I, 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 I just don't have the joy. I don't have the, the real joy of the Lord in my heart. I want you to come. I'm going to pray for you and believe the Lord to restore his joy to your heart right now. Amen. This is the conclusion of the message.